uh, Mark, a little bit of a background on, well, I, I guess really the event um, okay. more than anything else, but I want to kind of just get into, uh, you know, kind of the conversation and kind of see where it goes. So, okay. you know, uh, where, like, I guess what, what I want you to do, Jen, is just, you know, like picture us sitting out at Kits or, mm -hmm. you know, down somewhere in Richmond and we're having a coffee and we're just, you know, shooting the breeze on this, right? And Thank that's you. really what it is. And, you know, um, we'll, we'll talk about what, um, you know, you, your race and so on and so forth. Once this goes, um, once this goes live um, or the, the finished product gets put out, um, we'll push it out and we'll also do a giveaway for an open water um, safety package, which includes a swim buddy, bright colored cap, and a pair of goggles. Okay. Um, and what you can do, or what we can do, is we can coordinate that so it lines up with um, the registration for your race. So we can do it as a draw that you draw on race day, or you can do it in advance of your race or whatever. We'll discuss that. But off this episode, we'll give that away and use that as you know, a way to create some buzz around, you know, you, this conversation, your race, and and so on and so forth. So. Okay, sounds good. All right, I'm just going to, uh, I guess, play a little quick in intro video, and then we'll just kind of get, uh, we'll get things started. How does that sound? That's good. good. Okay. <laughs> All right, so Mark, welcome back. Episode two um, today, we got uh, Jennifer. Um, no, Jennifer, you gotta tell me. Do you prefer the full name Jennifer York Trije or just Trije or York or just just call me Jen? Jen. <laughs> it's okay. Jozik. It's a good Polish immigrant's name. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so we're talking with Jen today, who is, you know, a wonderful person, avid open water swimmer, and she is launching her own um, race this year called the Wild Bill Swim Challenge. And, um, you know, before we get into that, I just want to share a couple of things. Um, and maybe this will kind of shape where this discussion goes today. But last week when we were... Um, or last episode when we were talking about open water swimming, I, I brought up a particular fear around, you know, swimming where you can't see the bottom. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, both guests, uh, Andrea and Mark, um, you know, had plenty of supportive comments on that and so on and so forth. That piece of the conversation actually got a lot of traction online. Like a lot of people that could relate to that and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to share that with you, Mark. And see before we kind of jump into this conversation, if you if there's anything there that you wanted to add or any thoughts you had on the matter. Yeah, well, I guess from my perspective, and I've taught lots of open water swimmers too, is that um, you know of the many things that are different in open water compared to a pool, uh, not being able to see the bottom um, is one of those things that actually increases anxiety in some cases substantially. Um, you know, I was. I was listening to a, another podcast not too long ago about how the movie Jaws was made. And um, what was really interesting about it is that um, uh, when they went initially to try to sort of make for a sort of a fake shark, they had all kinds of practical difficulties. And the night before they shot, this sort of fake shark actually refused to work and they couldn't get it to move. And, and they had this massive stress uh, and Steven Spielberg actually thought like, what would Alfred Hitchcock do? And, and uh, he came up with the brilliant idea. It's not what you see, it's what you don't see that actually generates all kinds of anxieties. And that's why Hitchcock was so good at his movies. It wasn't what you saw that freaked you out. It's what you didn't see that freaked you out. And, and in the movie Jaws, there's only actually a couple of very short snippets of where you actually see a shark. And the overwhelming part of that movie has no sharks in it at all. And yet it's the most 
fear uh, generating movie of all time. <laughs> and it's all because it's all in your head, you know? So to get back to the point that, uh, you know, when, when people have fear of what they, uh, when they can't see bottom, it's, it's, you know, it's all about what they don't know that actually is generating the anxiety. And that anxiety can be, you know, there's a monster in the deep there. And of course, Jaws hasn't helped, you know, because uh, it's funny. It's funny how even in, in the lake that we have here, people are afraid <laughs> of a shark. It's like, oh, my God. So anyway, the point is that, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we all have to do is get over our sense of fears and start to rationalize what is irrational. And that's not actually as easy as it sounds. It, it's not, not at all. But I mean, uh, I'm actually heading out to Winnipeg and it's my goal to swim Lake Winnipeg in, or not across the whole thing, but a part of it, um, you know, in a few weeks and, and see how well that goes. So uh, moving back to you, Jen. Okay, so mm -hmm. this race this summer, the Wild Bill Swim, it's a commemorative race in yeah. a sense. It's named after your dad. Um, your dad, who you shared with me, had the moniker Mr. Butterfly because he won the first ever 200 meter butterfly at the 56 Olympics in, in Melbourne. Is that correct? Well, it's actually a little bit more than that. So Team USA calls him, which I just discovered a few weeks ago, the first butterflyer. And that's because, as you said, he swam butterfly as it swam today with the FINA rules for the first time in an international competition. But more than that, he and his coach are the ones that put together the dolphin kick with the butterfly stroke. So other people had been playing with like 13 beats a stroke, one beat a stroke, because they thought that the arms couldn't sustain a two kick, a two beat kick. They thought the shoulders wouldn't handle it. So my dad and his coach are the ones who put it together with, you know, typically breathe every other stroke, two beat kick. They're the ones who put that together. And it's the first time it was ever swum in competition was um, that that so that was and that was a long process so yeah no kidding i mean like talk about that i mean like that's pioneering stuff there because you know that's where it all comes from today isn't it yeah well and it's really interesting because there's often a lot of footage of the actual uh gold medal meet gold medal part um swim at the olympics but what's even more interesting is to watch the olympic trials before because my dad's the only one kicking with a butterfly kick dolphin kick and the others are still using breaststroke kick so he wasn't 10 meters ahead he was like 25 or 30 meters wow. ahead. so wow. it's, it's just like you don't see that stuff anymore was he the only one do, doing that at the olympics that particular uh, for year? The trials but quickly everyone else in the finals everybody oh. switched over yeah but he I mean, had he more 10 meters ahead but you know yeah so yeah. he would have had more experience at least doing it since everybody that since yeah everybody else was a late comer. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is great. Um, and going into that story a little bit more. So further, your dad only learned how to swim in college. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So my dad um, grew up uh, in a small town in Western Massachusetts. He was an Eagle Scout, totally outdoors focused, didn't make any sports team. He tried out for all the sports teams in high school, didn't make any of them. He was the towel boy. He was the manager. And he organized for the um, one of the, the the end of the year athletic banquet a speaker to come who was this gentleman named coach charles sylvia from springfield the swimming coach from springfield college and coach sylvia is the one who um basically invented all the uh, original life-saving skills and techniques um so my father was somehow got interested in him was fascinated by him ended up going to springfield college at age 15. now at that time, Springfield College was a YMCA college, and uh, everyone had to graduate learning how to swim, dive, and do life-saving techniques. So my dad knew he had to do that. He had graduate freshman year, first year of university. So uh, my dad knew he had to do that, and with so that was his first year. By his third year, he was an all-American swimmer. Wow. So to me, that's that, and the fact that. When he was 57 years old, he beat his Olympic time in the U.S. Masters Championship. Those two facts, to me, are the most interesting. <laughs> oh. 
Uh, when when I saw that stat, the two eleven, I was like, oh my god! Like he still would have final that Canadian trials, right? <laughs> he would have, you know, like at fifty seven years old, he would have final the Canadian trials. Yeah, Mark, you must be able to relate to that because you were you started to swim quite late in life as well. Yeah, I I um I mean, although I had nominal swim lessons as a eight and ten year old, I mean they they were in a cold pool, and you know there was one volunteer instructor um, teaching 20 kids and it really is pretty hard to understand the basics of you know, breathing and all this kind of stuff and I think the instructor had a pretty low bar to cross namely hey if you can tread water for 30 seconds we're going to call that swimming so I didn't learn how to swim until really until I was 50 and and you know it was really um, as I've told you before uh, Jason that it was my kids that shamed me into it because my, my wife was a lifeguard and because she was always a good swimmer, she took our kids into the pool before they were six months of age. And by the time they were six and seven, you know, they were just little fish. And, and there was, <laughs> there was one moment where I was, um, you know, the, we took the family to the local community pool and I was in the sort of the waiting pool with the kids and the kids got bored with that and started doing laps and left me <laughs> in the, <laughs> in the uh, wading pool and I thought you know this just isn't right <laughs> so anyway I, I got kind of half shamed into it and I also felt you know it was sort of a barrier mentally that I never had the courage if you will to face my you know fear or distrust of water and everything else I mean what what young adult or even adult for that matter doesn't have a bad water experience that you know distortedly colors their whole uh, perception of swimming and uh, I, I kind of knew I had to get over that for probably several decades yeah. <laughs> anyway it's, and so eventually I got there it's funny you say that because so I've been a swimming instructor for years but I love to teach the really little kids right I mean I've assisted with the older ones but I really I love the little ones and part of the biggest thing is to get the parents away like keep them yeah. away because yeah. you can have an experience in the water, but if the people around you react like, oh, wow, look what you just learned, or wow, wasn't that exciting? Maybe we don't want to do it again exactly like that, but you could do it like this. It changes how you function. And I've, I'm also a dive master, and I've seen it in a dive where you get a lot of current, and people come out of the water, and, they're, and you're like crawling across the bottom. People are come out of the water, and when you come out of the water, they say, "Oh, that was incredible!" It totally changes their experience and their memory of that moment. Yeah. And parents have so much influence on their kids that way. Yeah, and if they've had negative experiences, that you can almost feel their anxiety as their kid jumps into the water, and the and the, the kid is going like, "Is there something that I should be afraid of?" And yeah, yeah. And uh, then of course that can interfere with their ability to learn it. So yes, I, I agree. You know, the, the little kids, they, you know, they're still fresh, clean slates, right? And uh, they haven't been marred by you know, negative experiences. So that is the best time to get them. And it makes it easy as opposed to, you know, people like me, they're, <laughs> they're just hard to get past certain barriers. And that's, that's sort of the challenge. And that, ironically, that's actually why I like to teach swimming today is because I know what the barriers are. I've lived them for way too long. And um, and so when we prepare for our Cross Lake Swim this coming up in July, um, it's it's heavily attended by a whole bunch of people who really actually don't know how to swim. And and some of them, of course, you know, I can think of a couple of people who actually prefer to close their eyes when they swim because they don't want to know <laughs> that there's nothing underneath that they can see. I, I do the exact same thing, even though I've been swimming, you know, I'm a confident swimmer. I've been swimming in open water for quite a while in lakes in the sea. I do the same thing. Well, I have one of those. I was a teenager when Jaws came out at a swim camp, um, swimming three times a day and for years and years and years. And I read Jaws and I never went to see the movie because I thought, oh, that'll be too much. But even when I'd swim alone early in the morning in a big pool, you know, they have those lights in the pool. Yeah. Imagination, you were talking about the brain, yeah. went to, oh, those are shark doors. And they bring the sharks out at night to clean up the pool and they forgot to have one in. I'm going to flip her right into a shark, right? It's just like <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> so I keep my eyes closed and I open them when I, when I, when I. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we have one of our, one of our um, best known swimmers here, a girl who won the triathlon world, the ITU triathlon world championships in the 90s superbly good swimmer as is most of, most of her family 
she doesn't wear goggles when she swims across the lake, so she deliberately cannot see. Wow. <laughs> like she's a great swimmer. Yeah. But she, but she, I no, I don't wear goggles. I don't want, I don't want to see anything. <laughs> I'm interested to understand um, how you pull in the people who aren't great swimmers to your event, because that's, I have a small, the, our event has four different races. Two of them are for like a three mile and a one mile. Sorry, it's in miles over there. Yeah. Um, then there's like a swim paddle relay that's short half mile each way. But then there's just a 400 yard swim that's like from a camp dock to the beach. And I'm imagining, I did that really for the locals, right? And central Massachusetts is a place <laughs> that historically doesn't have a lot of swimming because it was an industrial town. So they didn't have the money to build the pools. The kids played baseball and football and that kind of thing. So, um, I mean, I'm happy if somebody's going to wear a float, if they want to kick it. I mean, it's a short distance. It's a straight arrow and mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of security mm -hmm. around, but I need to pull them in. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, that's a really, really great question. Um, and honestly, I'm not totally sure. I know the singular answer to that, but I can give you several ideas. Um, first of all, our, our event has been around for, you know, really almost a century. Um, we've had the luxury of a nice big long lake. The lake is 140 kilometers long, so you know 80 miles, yeah. and um, and yet most of it is two kilometers wide or sometimes even less. Mm -hmm. And um, where our town is is sort of near one of the areas where it's a bit narrower. And um, you know, from time immemorial, there have been people kind of looking at the lake, going, "I wonder if I can swim across this as opposed to taking a boat." So it, mm -hmm. it's always been a little bit of a a challenge, at least among local people. And given that this is sort of a recreational area, we've always had um, uh, kids swimming programs, at least historically, um, having the kids would try to prove to their parents that they were safe to be near the lake mm -hmm. by proving it by being able to swim across it. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, um, I guess it was a rite of passage here that that swimming across the lake is something that you do if you live in the Okanagan, even if you ever only do it once. Now, that said, um, the other thing that's really important, I think, is that we've really de-emphasized our, our, our swim as a race. We call it an event. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you can really tell that it is. Like, sure enough, there's all kinds of really great swimmers who show up and they're given her, you know, and they, they want to beat X and they want to beat their time and, you know, have at her, guys. And there's usually about 80 or 100 of those people that, you know, like, just get out of their way because they're going to cream this thing. But everybody else, the other 800, 900 people that actually do the event, don't give a rat's ass about their time or who they beat. They want to actually say that they did it. And what's kind of funny is, although we have a timing mat at the start of the race and a, start, a, a finishing mat at the end to get your actual time, no one really remembers what their time was on any given day, nor does it matter. And, and, uh, I, I guess what's what's really interesting about this is that when people are finally swimming their last sort of 10 meters and the moment that they can see the bottom and and see that it's shallow enough to put their feet on it and stand, that's actually when they go, yes, I did it. And then there's all these people on the beach going, no, 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 the timing mat's still up there. you got to finish. And they don't give a damn about that. They don't give a damn about that. Now, on our website, too, we actually encouraged and said, hey, this is just a great time. It's a family experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why don't you join us? It's, it's just totally fun. And of course, we try to enlist as much. We have several very good swimmers here who are also have for years volunteered their time to, um, to coach. And so, so we, we spend five or six weeks before the event, every single Saturday in the weeks before the event, just to expose people to open water swimming. Mm -hmm. And and like I said, I, I tend to get the anxious beginners and I'm totally fine with that. And I, I love, you know, going through the list of here, are all the things that, you know, increase your anxiety and we'll go through that. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to give them as much security about that whole event as possible. And of course, we also emphasize the safety of our event in the same that, like we have 50 lifeguards on the water when we actually have this event. They're on paddle boards. They're on power boats. We have we have a row of twenty four power boats, twelve on either side, like literally every couple of hundred meters, with two lifeguards on each boat. And so, 
So between that and the paddle boarders, we have like almost 300 watercraft on the water. I mean, honestly, you could almost walk this swim because of the boats on it. So, so when you, when you try to combine the, the idea that, you know, Hey, this is a, a sort of a cultural passage. You, you get sort of comfortable with the idea that it's as safe an event as it possibly can be. And we de-emphasize this is not about your testosterone levels. This is really just about enjoying the event on a beautiful sunny day in the Okanagan at the best time of the year. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if any one of those is the, the most important, I think, taken together. They really do help engage. And I'm actually surprised. Almost 50% every single year, almost 50% of all of our participants are newcomers. And of those, several of them uh, have never swum 2,000 meters in their entire life. Wow. So I, I also have, am going down that route for, I mean, I have the one in the three mile swim, but those are early in the morning, you know, when the lake is quiet and I have promoted it as an event. There's no official timing mechanism. I mean, it's going to be small to see yeah. another year yeah. and I'm going to have some food trucks and some, you know, face painters for the kids. Nice, and nice. There's, there's like a, a vintage bathing beauties and blokes pageant, you know, nice. is commit. So and the press uh, that I've gotten a lot of local press because of my dad's name and a lot of swim swam and swimming world press, they're kind they're promoting it that way too, which is great. So I'm just, I'm also allowing people to register day of for 400 yards. I mean, it's 10 bucks and you can just get in the water. So I'm hoping that this will, what, what has happened for you will slowly happen for us too. Yeah. You know, if you can, like, I, as you probably well know, I certainly know it, the, the idea that um, if you're not feeling like you are a swimmer, that like you don't have a swimming pedigree, that, you know, like, hey, I never learned how to swim as a kid. It's remarkable what the stat is. I think if you don't learn how to swim by age 20, your chance of learning how to swim after that is almost zero. Most people are pretty entrenched with their reality if they are a swimmer or if they're not by the time they've grown up. And, and, you know, the, the thing that, that we've had to do, and we're fortunate, we have a, we have a one beach area that's quite, it's 300 meters wide and probably about 200 meters into the lake. And the whole thing uh, doesn't get uh, deeper than neck deep in water. So it's a very safe place to swim. You know, if you choke on water, you can just stand and you're fine. And we use that sort of arena, if you will, um, as our teaching area. And so it's just sort of just encouraging, hey, here, here are the baby steps. And yes, we're going to have to deal with swimming without a line underneath you. And the, yeah, there are ducks over there and you might see the odd fish and there's some weeds over here. And, and like, like each of these is a little mini barrier that if we can cross them all in a very safe environment, then I think we're more likely to get some of these people to actually say, you know what, I think I'm ready to do this. And, and we give these lessons out for free um, for all of our registrants. And if you're not a registrant and if you're not ready to do this, five bucks, you know, and uh, you'll, you'll get an hour of, of good instruction. You know, we have we have uh, five uh, channel swimmers here who all uh, share in the instruction. And funny enough, most people that show up to our Saturday lessons don't go to them. They're too good. They, they actually come to me because, and I'm not, I'm not blowing my own horn here. It's because they can, they can relate, uh, at least I, they, they think I know how I can relate to them much better because all those people who were channel swimmers have swum since they were two and they don't know what they know. What they know is they completely take for granted. They've got their breathing control and they can vary this and that. They have all their strokes under control and the average adult swimmer. Yeah. They want to do this rite of passage thing, but they just have a bunch of little baby hurdles that they get, get need to get over, including, you know, hey, I can't see bottom. Yeah. Or if I touch a weed, I'm going to freak out. And oh, then oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. It's wonderful to watch. It's <laughs> I know. I, I love that idea about giving lessons in the weeks before. That's definitely something I could incorporate in future years. Yeah. I am going to do a... Um, I'm setting up my own little open water interview series in the next month and a half or month. And one of them will be, how do you transition from pool to open water and that kind of thing? Not as, not as um, beginner as, as what you're talking about, but that's a really wonderful idea. Yeah. I really yeah. enjoy 
Really? Yeah. So if, if you understand the sort of the long list of differences, you know, like, you know, the water is colder, it's not as clean and it has stuff in it and it has stuff on it. And then there's wind and there's wave and, you know, and there's distance and it looks too big and, yeah. you know, on and on and on. Each one of those sort of adds a bit of anxiety. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as I say, we, we convince people that, you know, wearing a wetsuit is having like having your life preserver on. You can sit there and float all afternoon in it. And yeah, sure, you might be out in the middle of the lake, but you're not going to drown because you can just sit there all day. You know, we'll find you. You know, they're just a few minutes away. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. So if 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 we can sort of essentially undress every single one of their anxieties one at a time, and everybody has a slightly different set, but I know I know what the whole set is. So if I cover them all, chances are I can get there. And and if they hear that, you know, you're going to give a few lessons, and I I actually know that there are some. You know, truly serious uh, open water swims out there that are much bigger in distance, um, for which you almost have to prove your pedigree before you actually are allowed to register. Mm -hmm. So, in a loose sense, that's what we're doing too. Um, it's it's actually a pretty straightforward, easy two-kilometer swim, but still, you got to prove your pedigree. And the, the best best way to prove it is to come out to these lessons for the first five weeks. And and if if you're not getting anywhere after five weeks, I actually tell them. I said, you know, I don't think you're ready. We'll, we'll, we'll roll over your uh, registration to next year and I'm happy to work with you all summer if you want. And, you know, just make, making sure that they've, they've got all the bases covered and we, we want to obviously have a safe uh, and successful event. We don't want to have to be, you know, have some kind of tragedy, even one Mars an event, even if, if, if you do nothing wrong. So we want to make sure everybody's happy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to that you know, what Mark said in terms of it being a destination. I mean, like my, um, my wife and mother-in-law have swam that race for the last, well, obviously not the last two years, but certainly the, you know, three, four, five previous years prior to COVID and whatnot. And it really is, it's, it's a wonderful event. Like it's a destination. It's very welcoming, you know, and so on and so forth. And it sounds like you're on your way to building that for yourself, Jen. I hope so. That's, that's my idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is it, you know, taking it one step further from what we we're talking about, like what does it mean to you to have this race in honor of your dad? Well, um, so the idea of the race came about kind of in two stages. Um, my dad was also a groundbreaking anesthesiologist um, in Western Massachusetts. And when he was uh, in his, well, he died at the lake, but at overlooking the lake. But um, when he was in the hospital for the period of time he was there, the anesthesiologist came in and they really bonded. They were both fishermen. They were both swimmers. And, you know, and the guy said, oh, well, the, the epidural pain block. And my dad said, oh, I'm the one who brought that to Massachusetts. You know, so they had a lot of things in common. Um, and then I would say that would have been August. And then the following spring, um, my brother, my mother and I all living in separate locations, got all these hand drawn cards from little kids about swimming saying, oh, it was so fun to learn about your dad. Oh, I'm so glad we learned how to swim. And I didn't know what was going on. So this anesthesiologist had gone to his local lake and sponsored um, all the kids that wanted to go to learn how to swim with the teacher who had this program set up already on that lake. And I thought, to myself, wow, I, I could have done that. That would have been a wonderful thing to do. And then that was also the summer that I was starting to do more open water races. And I went to one that was for the preservation of a big pond, a salt pond in Rhode Island. And I said, wow, well, we're, we have this big program for our lake. And I thought I could bring those two together. Um, and for me, um, like I mentioned before, the the parts of my dad's story that I find the most inspirational, it's not that he won a gold medal. It's not that he was 10 meters ahead in the finals of the Olympics. It was none of that. It's, it's how, when and how he learned how to swim. On the table. Yeah. On the what table. he did when he was older. Those, Sorry. Those, it's, okay. it's, true. It's, it's what life is, right? Um, and I find that that's, that's what like that's what we can impart to people and i know that um well i'll take my son for example we moved from europe to canada when he was 13 and he'd been swimming on a team but a really low key team like really low key and he gets here to and jason was his coach his first coach um 
or a second coach actually. Um, and he had a whole different level of practice and competition than he'd ever experienced. And he felt really far behind. And so he was put in a group with kids of his current ability, but his brain went much further ahead. And so now he's jumped a, quite a bit in his progression and the kids around him say, well, you know, we burnt out. We're like practically burnt out. We're so tired of doing this. And he's like, I'm just getting started. Right. So he still has that. He says, I don't care how old I am. I'm going for it. Right. So um, and my dad was not someone to talk about all this. We don't talk about it a lot in our family. It just is. Right. And I think that if no matter what you do in your life, if you can um, realize that now is the best time to start, no matter when now is, mm -hmm. um, it brings so much into your life. Um, now, the second side of that, which I'm just starting to comprehend since I met you a couple of weeks ago, Jason, is Jason told me that the original mission of the lake swim that you're doing, Mark, is to teach like all the third graders how to swim or mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So for me, coming from as this place is a uh, is, is not a big swimming location, not this town, but this whole area of Massachusetts. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, which is a big swimming area. Um, and I see the, the joy that it brings my son and my daughter. She's not a competitive swimmer anymore, but she's a fish. And I know I've traveled and lived around the world. And no matter when I felt a little, you know, you go through lots of stages of uncertainty and growth. I just get in the water and I would enter my world. And if, if I, if we could help little kids just, to be able to be happy to play in the water and then they can, they can learn how to swim. Now that right now, that's, it's like a, it's like a mission that's almost making me tear in, in like purpose. Yeah. So yeah. it's funny how this all just kind of came together. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that's totally great. I, I can completely relate to that. I mean, with, with our kids program, um, you know, like I, I was a physician for 30 years and, and when I retired, you know, like it was a privilege and an honor to have worked with people individually one on one. But to be perfectly honest with you, I get more satisfaction teaching swimming because I can make a difference in larger groups and and make a difference in a way that is obvious. Like, you know, they have a, you know, people as soon as they get over their fear of water and they actually start to work with it and realize that it's not out to get you but it's just another milieu in which to enjoy. Your, your world has just expanded. Exactly. Um, I mean, 70% of the world's population is, or, sorry, the world's surface is water. And there's almost nobody anywhere that isn't near some water of some form. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, you know, we are all, all to some extent uh, a culture of people that should be familiar with water. I mean, here in Kelowna, we uh, we consider ourselves a lake culture. We have this big ass lake right next door to us. And so whether or not you like it or not, you are interacting with that lake almost every day. You cross it, you're near it, you play in it, you play on it. Um, and so why don't we complete the fluency that you deserve to have as opposed to sort of blocking out a, sing a significant part of your life to incorporate it. And so our event, because it's grown so well, and I think so many people have enjoyed the successes of it, and we've actually been able to save money as a result of that, we have partnered with the local YMCA here, and we have a lovely big 50-meter pool. And uh, we have a, our school district, which comprises something like 30 different elementary schools in our area. We've been able to fund swimming lessons for every kid in grade three um, for the entire area. So what, what I think is so exciting is making a difference in the lives of our entire community because these kids are all going to grow up to some degree anyway, becoming swimmers. Who knows? Some of them will become awesome, great Olympics, uh, Olympians. But having said that, if they do nothing more than to enjoy the milieu for what it is and no longer be afraid of it and be part of it, um, then you know what? My job is done. I, and I, I live with the satisfaction of knowing it's, it's like having a, a, a child that is successfully, you know, 
taken on the world because of your input. And I find that tremendously satisfying, arguably even more satisfying than one-on-one -on -one, uh, engagement when, when I have in a family doctor's office where I'm writing a stupid prescription and saying, here, take this. It, it just doesn't feel as, as warm and fuzzy. That's all I can say. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful. I, I really starting to look at this whole mission. I didn't know where it was going to go when I started it, uh, but I'm really, I knew it would continue, but this is really speaking to me what I've learned in the last few weeks. So I, and I have the resources and that's, that's what's amazing is that, um, so I grew up with all these amazing people around me, right? So when your father is, is performs at that kind of level and his coach performs at that kind of level, you're surrounded with people like, you know, the a lieutenant, whatever, the colonels in the, in the Marines who fly in in a helicopter, pick them up and then go bring lobster back for lunch, right? Yeah. My, my dad was, uh, he was also the coach and swimmer at the Univer University of Toronto swim team when he did medical school there. And one of his good friends um, became a good friend is named Dr. Joe McGinnis. And he's the guy who he's studied with the narwhal whales. He's like the Canadian Jacques Cousteau. Mm -hmm. And together, he's the first one to go down in this um, underwater submarine that goes really, really deep. Um, he and my dad helped put together the Naui and the Paddy um, diving tables back in the day. So wow. I've got all these people around me mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. are aging, right? Mm -hmm. That I had thought about three years ago, I thought, oh, I think I need to write a book and I need to interview all these people. And then they started dying, right? I'm like, holy moly, I got to get going. No, no, and then no, no. this came up. And so I'm coming with like some of them are doing interviews, but I, I have these resources to, um, people in the media and different coaches and swimmers who have swum the English channel, who have done all those kind of things that I can bring, I can channel for other uses. Right. And by the way, you're right. Those English channel swimmers, they're all a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're way out there. And unfortunately the average person um, cannot relate to a, a, a channel swimmer. No. You know, like when you're, when you're trying to sort of, um, generates interest in the water and open water swimming, et cetera. Um, you have to sort of look at the lowest common denominator, not the ultimate goal. You know, yeah. in any given population, you know, 0.01% of all of your swimmers are going to be Olympians. And the rest are just going to be, you know, people who enjoy it, who get nice exercise, who are going to live till their 90s swimming in their favorite pond or whatever it is. Yeah. But um, they don't give a rat's ass about the, the competition part. And, you know, I think I think the great advantage you have is you have you have the pedigree, you have all of the connections that you ever need. And yet what you're going to have to do is tone that down for the average person who doesn't really care about that. They just really want to care about, hey, I just want to feel safe in the water. I want to feel comfortable there and I don't want to you know, be a burden to my family in some way. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, people have very simple goals about the water. And I think that's a. That's the, the easiest way out. And I, I guess I feel fortunate that, you know, I, I didn't come from a pedigree of swimmers at all. Um, but I was able to come at it from just sort of a, this, a camaraderie, if you will, an enjoyment of the water. And, and then, of course, um, to, to, to uh, glance into what, what was already here, namely that, that sort of rite of passage that we've had here in our community for so mm -hmm. long because the lake just sits there beckoning every single day all summer long. So my dad's um, swim coach, Coach Sylvia, he, um, at a certain point, I don't remember when, um, started a Pinal Swim School, which was a summer camp, big, tw I mean, 25 yard outdoor pool, soccer fields, tennis courts, stuff like that. Total visionary because that stuff didn't exist back then in the 60s. And so we all learned with a whole bunch of normal kids, like, we didn't learn with pedigree. We learned mm -hmm. like everybody else. There was everybody in the neighborhoods and all the, and they had boarding students for competitive swimming and stuff like that. But it was really based in teaching the little ones how to swim. There's this, he's the one, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called an egg. It's the first floating device that was on the back so that oh, yeah. kids could use their arms. So he developed that. He developed plinths in order to do, um, like rubber band work and cable work and stuff like that, which he never patented. So it's gone on to other people, but he developed all that stuff because 
it was the same kind of thing. He, his daughters, his family, all the mothers of all those coaches and swimmers, they were all the little kids. And their philosophy was one child, one adult, because mm-hmm. that's how they feel safe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And everybody learned to swim crawl stroke. First thing, crawl stroke and backstroke, right? So it, um, I, I, I come from that too, right? Mm-hmm. So hopefully that's what's going to come through in. Well, the, the, then you have then you have actually the best of all worlds, don't you? Because on the one hand, you can connect to all those those egghead racers who want to cream the cream your events, and you can relate to them and understand them. But on the other hand, you know, like like we we always try to advertise our event is to be literally all things to all people. You can race it if you want, or if you just want to actually enjoy the process, you can do that too. And it's okay, you know. So, so I think if you can, it's it's a challenge to do this. I think. I mean, so many coaches in different sports sort of are so focused on the elitism of it all. They actually leave the overwhelming part of the population behind, and and that's that's not always good. We have a big triathlon here. You know, there's eleven, twelve hundred people who show up to our triathlon, and fifty of them are elites. But the other 1,100 are all everyday Joes. They're age groupers. You know, they're, they're doing it to say they did it. Um, and, you know, they're average swimmers and average runners and average cyclists. But they actually pay the bills. They're the ones who actually pay the bills. All the elites are getting sponsored by everybody and boarded by other families. And they don't bring a dime into the community. You know, right. it's, the, it's the, the, the age groupers that do. So yeah. having been an age grouper myself, I can relate to that personally as well. Well, and I'm also trying to help out the local businesses because this part of the state is a lot of small time entrepreneurs, right? Small companies, they do re- they do well and they serve the community and they work really hard. And so that's, I'm trying to bring them in to say, okay, well, let's all go there after or let's, you can go eat yeah. here or you can go what, so to me, it's really also a community event. So it sounds very similar, but I'm just on a small scale. <laughs> well, to that point um one of our long-term sponsors is um our local credit union and the credit union has worked hard at trying to be sort of all things and they they talk a lot about the word community they actually want to be part of the community in so many ways but the thing that keeps them coming back to be our major and title sponsor is the fact that they totally love and they've said this to us many times we just love how happy people are at your event and how it is very much a community of kids and adults and older, like, you know, this year we have, um, we're going to set a record this year because we have at least a couple of seven-year-olds doing the event. And we have a woman who is just turning 90 doing the event. So we have a, basically an 85 year spread Mm -hmm. from youngest to oldest. Now tell me if that doesn't cover most of the community, right? So, so to the extent that, um, if you can, you know, generate whether title sponsorship or some kind of sort of recognition for your sponsors and get them to realize the value of attaching their name to a whole bunch of smiling faces mm-hmm. at the end. You know, when you see people yeah. going, yes, I did it. You know, um, that's a that's uh, something that I think a lot of um, community minded businesses would really like to uh, be part of. Yeah, I think that we um, we've kind of gone away from the local businesses in terms of looking for sponsors because we want to help them and Mm. they get they get asked for a million things. I'm sure on to some our two big sponsors are both financial organizations. Um, And I think that one of them committed for two years already. But I think that once we can connect what you say the joy and the fun that's actually going to happen, they'll be able to see it in the years to come. Yeah. 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 Cause the, our, our similar, sp- our, our sponsor, our title sponsor, we actually got them the year that they decided not to sponsor another event that was called the, it's called the ski to sea. We had this race from the top of big white mountain all the way down to the lake. And it was a, a, a it was a relay of, Skiers, cross-country skiers, um, bike riders, canoeists, runners, etc., all the way down to the lake. But the event attracted a whole bunch of, you know, hothead athletes, mm-hmm. and and quite a few of these weren't even from town. And mm-hmm. so, like, 
they had sponsored this for a few years and they go, you know what? It doesn't really align well with our values. And so we just sort of were waiting in the weeds saying, well, we've got something that might align with your values. And uh, they've been our title sponsor for 10 years. And e every single year um, they say, well, we're only going to do it for one more year. And there was a year that they decided that they weren't going to sponsor us anymore. And they said, well, we're going to, we're, we're changing our, our focus to, um, you know, people in need and, and, and psychological supports and stuff like this. Anyway, we, we let a few of our swimmers know that, hey, they're not going to continue. And there, there was this one woman who was a teacher and she was absolutely outraged. She went back to, the, to, to our title sponsor and she said, do you realize what these people are supporting is, is these swimming lessons and these kids in grade three, they come back as new people. They're no longer bullied anymore. They actually have better relationships with their kids. We see this as the most profound psychological event in our uh, experience for our grade threes. Mm -hmm. And then, they, they, you know, two weeks later, we get a phone call from our title sponsor. Hey, listen, I'm really sorry, but I think we would like to come back. Can you let us back in? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you guys both share a very holistic view of the whole thing. And I think that that's a great connection between, you know, both people, both events, both organizations. Mm -hmm. And certainly for you, Jen, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, as long as I've known you, you've mm -hmm. always, that's who you've always been. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, like bringing that down to, you know, I guess really it's almost like a homecoming, isn't it? It's where it all started for you. Right. Oh, so yeah. and coming full circle and bringing it back and, you know, paying homage and honor to, you know, some people that were, were pioneers and, you know, cared a lot about, you know, this and making sure people had their well-being and, and were, you know, were well taken care of and so on and so forth, right? I mean, like, yeah. the thing that Mark alluded to in terms of, you know, like, the people walking out and putting their hands over their head with this massive sense of accomplishment, I mean, like, that's the money shot. Like, that's what somebody leaves there thinking, man, what an awesome event, what an awesome accomplishment or whatever. And, you know, like, I, I know the event's been going on for a long time, but like I've been to many, you know, races and open water events, triathlons, swim meets, and so on and so forth. Let's not even put swim meets on the table because they are so boring. Um, but open water swims and it, it, the across the lake swim, and uh, I could see the wild bill swim going this way as well. It's just, you know, it's not, as Mark said, it's not the race. It truly is an event. You come in on the Thursday, you spend a few days around town, you hang out, you go to the, the race site in the morning. It's usually sunny. Um, I think, Mark, you got to correct me if I'm wrong. You got the pancakes going when people come across. Um, you know, they're coming, they're getting bus to the other side of the lake. They're swimming across. Everybody's happy. And it's just like, it, like it's a full, you know, half day of just people hanging out. And having a good time and the good time is what takes precedent and the race is just one of those things that facilitates that good time mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's this is essentially right i mean we, we we use our biggest single park which happens to be next to the lake so it it is our central venue if you will mm -hmm. uh and as jason mentioned we the rotary local rotary club has a pancake breakfast that they um provide for uh Firstly, nothing. We give it to them for free if they're part of the event and anybody else can buy a bunch of pancakes for a buck or something like that. And, uh, and, and what we now have developed actually is a whole bunch of booths around um, the, the finish line where, um, you know, obviously there's going to be vendors of sorts who want to promote their product, whatever they are. Um, we've actually been able to do one more really interesting bridge, and that is to our local... Um, indigenous community um the uh, you know our lake i mean has the legendary ogo pogo in it and um there is a um a first nations equivalent of that word i cannot say i don't even know how to but uh anyway we've connected with them because uh you know part of part of the swim actually starts on first nations land and comes across the lake and it's very symbolic if you will you know, it starts there, and so it's a, it's literally a bridge across from First Nations property to, you know, white man property, if you will. And because of that, and, and we've had many discussions with the First Nations here locally, 
And they've been totally awesome about wanting to be participating in it. So they actually get out their war canoe and the only time it ever comes out is for our event. And the, the, the war canoe uh, seats 14 people and seven of them are local indigenous elders and the other seven on the other side on the other side of the canoe are local RCMP officers. So um, again, they're working together and they lead the swim, if you will. And the other part that's really fun is that we have one of their um, community elders, his, his name is Grouse Barnes, and he blesses the swim to start with. And basically he, he gives a small five minute prayer, if you will, and he includes basically you know, like, you know, the water is our life. We need to respect it and we need to be safe out there and we need to be our brothers. And, and like it, it just, it's a very sort of communal kind of a feeling where, where you can kind of feel this, like, hey, we're all in this together, you know, and this is not really a race. I mean, go ahead and race if you want, but if somebody's in trouble out there, you know, you just want to actually put your arm around them and wave for them if they need help or something like that. Anyway, he does a really nice job of, of laughing at everybody for how badly they pronounce the Indian version of Ogopogo. Um, but then he also finishes off with um, the reverence he has for the water, the sun, the lake, the land, and um, um, it puts everybody in a in a very humble and sincere mood, which is really unbeatable. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So um, to wrap this up, Jim, um, how do people get to your race, register, register for your race? Are you taking registrations from anybody, anywhere? Are you focusing on the local community? Tell, well, us, tell people how they get there. So you can see Streamy across the bottom, wildbillswim.org. Their registration has been open for about a month. Um, it'll take you through a race roster website um, to do that. It's all secure and we don't hold any information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we accept everyone. There is a checkbox uh, at the bottom. Are you physically able to swim the distance you have signed up for? There is student discounts. There are team discounts. Um, we're hoping I'm um, working with some of the local swim clubs and masters clubs to try and pull some of them in just because the young people bring a lot of energy and it's fun. Um, and I guess that's, yeah, that's it. And especially the 400 yard swim, you know, it's really for everybody. If you want to kick it with a kickboard, if you want to wear a float, if you want to do it in a, um, a donut, like an inflatable donut or on a unicorn and paddle your way in, just come on over. We've got lots of security for that event. All the boats and all the lifeguards will be in that little area swimming right. from a camp dock to a beach. So it's not, right. you're going straight over. Um, so yeah, that's how you do it. And then the environmental piece, just, uh, we didn't really touch on that yet, but right. there, there's an environmental component for this year that, Mm -hmm. you know, like might transform into something for another year, but for this year, like what's the significance of that? So the, there's two, they're actually considered great ponds. They're not, we call them the lake, but they're actually great ponds uh, from a, a scientific perspective. And they have this phosphorus turnover that happens to them um, over different periods of an environment, evolution of a pond. And it creates a lot of guck on the lake, on the beaches. It creates, um, there's weeds that have, they're non-indigenous and that they can take over the lake and choke it. And every year or most years, they have to treat them with uh, some pesticides in certain areas. So this year, the lake uh, association has won a grant from the government to treat the phosphorus, which will keep all of that stuff down at the bottom for like 10 or 20 years. So we don't have to treat it with as many pesticides or if any. Um, and so this is to Ben, it's a matching grant. So the government gave us a certain amount, the local, there's three towns who are on this particular great pond and those cities have given us uh, some of the matching money. We've raised it ourselves among the lake residents and this will go towards that. In future years, uh, there will always be a percentage that goes towards the lake. They are also, the, so the lake association is our host location sponsor. Um, they pay for the insurance and they help. I mean, it's all volunteers from them. Um, but a big 
and going forward, another will go towards some kind of swimming scholarship, related scholarship, whether it be uh, or initially until I've had these conversations the last few weeks, could have been a teacher who's teaching some programs, could be a, a kid who needs to go to a, a recruiting swim camp. I don't know what it's going to be. It might be looking at the educational system and see are the YMCA's in that area ready to take on this project. It's totally inspiring to me what what you guys are doing, Mark. So um, that's where the money will go in the future. Yeah, and to, to be clear, I mean, that's what Mark and Peter have been kind of, you know, cheering up and like I've I've been the beneficiary of their hard work and so on and so forth. And where what I'm grateful to be able to do is bring people like you guys together. It's right. Been, so yeah. we can create this community and whether it's sharing stuff that helps a swimmer get into the water and enjoy it. And really, as Mark often talks about it, you know, from a you know meditative or, you know, like you know, transcendental uh, point of view, you know, like really get into that benefit or it just helps, you know, some like, you know, you two come together, you develop a relationship, you know, ultimately just creates a better ecosystem and everybody flourishes. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the quotes the media has picked on, up the most is uh, something I said last year, actually, which what coming from Jericho Beach here and swimming in the bay where the water is cold and seawater is a little harsher than, um, than fresh water. I got in the lake there and I thought, I just feel like my entire body was caressed by velvet. Mm. And people are taking that like, wow, is it really like that? I'm like, yeah, it really is. It doesn't matter how long you get in the water or not. It really is like that. And for me, swimming always has been, and this again, it comes from Springfield College being the YMCA college of the time, and it's still their crest, the, tr the YMCA triangle, spirit, mind, body. Yeah. And that's still, that's always, that's how I was raised. It's how I live my life, whether it was conscious or unconscious. It's really been my driving force, my entire adult life. You can find all clear in the water. Well, I, look, I, I think that's an awesome place to leave it. I want to thank you both for sharing your time and uh, Mark for co-hosting this with me and whatnot. So um, the Wild Bill Swim is happening in uh, the beginning of August, August 7th, I believe. Mm -hmm. The Across the Lake Swim coming up uh, in about three weeks, uh, three, four weeks in Kelowna. And, um, you know, thanks uh, for opening up registration again, Mark and Peter, because yeah, no my wife went to register for the race and it had already sold out. So they had opened up more spots. So, I mean, like that's, it's got to be a great feeling because I know that, you know, Mark, you had originally thought that we we're going to cap it and, and, you know, not overshoot what might happen, but there seems to be demand kind of roaring back. Yeah, and it, there's a certain uh, psychology to sort of uh, capping it, and then sort of there's this feeling of urgency to, to sign up for it. And sure enough, we get registrants, and and people are just chomping at the bit, and we'll open another couple hundred spots, and 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 it goes on and on. And so so unofficially, I can say that we probably do have room for 800 swimmers. We're not saying that out loud right now, um, but uh, you know, 100 at a time and. That, that just gets people registering, you know, nothing else. So, um, yeah, like, it, you know, until the pandemic, we were having, you know, 1,200 people in the water, um, which was getting close to our maximum safe point. You know, like there's only so many people you can keep safe in the water after a while. And and uh, we don't want any more than 1,500 registrants at any one point. There's always about 10% who don't, don't show up. Um, so, Anyway, we're we're trying to get back on our feet, if you will, in the water. Let's put it that way, um, and uh, we'll see we'll, we'll see what this uh, this next year or two does. Uh, with a bit of luck, it'll just pick up again. But uh, Jen, if if there's anything that you would like to know from our event, uh, any way we can help you, uh, I'd be more than delighted to share with that. And we'd certainly give you a complimentary entry to our event if you ever show up for it. Well, um, I think you're going to have to book it in next year. Yeah, well, you know where to find us. It's, yeah. Well, uh, and I think next fo this coming fall, I'm going to have to just go up there and you can help me figure out who can accompany me across the lake on a paddle. Oh, yeah, no worries. Because um, I don't want to swim it. I, I, we have, well, I can I can tell you 500 people right now that would be more than delighted to help you swim across the lake. Yeah. No problem. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks to you both. Really appreciate you know you sharing the time and all the best to you, Jen, and you know, hopefully the first year of this race really, you know, is a spark of something that really 
gross. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks awesome. for having us again, Jason. Yeah. So I just.